11 experiences in my life being going on 80 next year. And probably one of the most dramatic was when I was in service. And I was young, it was 1957, I was just in my early 20s, and I was drafted. My girlfriend dumped me, <laughs> and uh, my job wasn't very secure. So I went into service, a little bit of chip on my shoulder, but uh, they really took it out of me. I lost a lot of weight, especially during the infiltration course, and that's where it's about a football field long and it has uh, barbed wire, it's got holes where they send out small bombs, they have machine guns shooting in your head, over your head, literally right over your head. And uh, you would go through, crawl this on your belly, keeping your rifle dry, and at the end, you were supposed to uh, fix your bayonet on the end of your rifle and stab this straw dummy, a, a dummy if you will. And the, uh, unfortunately, I guess I didn't, wasn't enthused enough to about what I was doing in stabbing this dummy. And once I stabbed him a few times, the lieutenant who was standing there said, you didn't do that good enough, so go do it again. So I was one of the few people that had to do the infiltration course twice. And by that time, I uh, was getting very bloody and uh, it was a hard George of clay and you scraped your elbows and knees and it bled through your khakis. But the most dramatic part was that the machine gun bullets were literally right over your head. And there's episodes such as uh, someone being afraid of a snake, standing up and actually being riddled uh, with live machine gun bullets and uh, has been known to have cut them in half. That whole thing was very traumatic to me and that sort of was the epitome of the most dangerous parts of my uh, career in the Army. And of course, right after boot camp, I came home on leave, which was traditional, and I met uh, now my wife of 53 plus years, and uh, it's been quite an, a ride and everything uh, since then. Well, after the Army, uh, actually during the Army, as I mentioned, I was on leave, and I met this young lady and we communicated back and forth for the remainder of the two years I was in the service. And the army paying being such as it is, it was not very, very much. So we decided to get married when I finally was released from the service, but we didn't have much of any money. In fact, I couldn't even afford a marriage license. But in the service, I had been taught uh, microwave communications and had received a security clearance. And once I searched for a number of jobs in civilian life and find out, found out that what I learned in the military wasn't appropriate for a civilian life, I received a uh, letter, sort of magically from above, that says that the government agency wanted me to be part of a secret uh, government uh, national security system along the Alaskan coast and that I had an opportunity to go to Alaska, get trained for three months, and then spend another month, another year in, uh, on one of the sites, and I was making more money than I could have imagined at the time, which according to my budget with my future wife, that would allow us to get married, go back to school, uh, to uh, college, and then hopefully land a decent job. So, I accepted the job and I went to Alaska, spent three months in training, uh, received top secret clearance, which of course made it very difficult for me to say too much about what I was doing to my future wife. But in the process, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, uh, the plane crashed, uh, rolled over. Uh, when I was landing at the uh, far site, I was not stationed at the best site, Anchorage, but I was stationed far north in the site, right on the Arctic Ocean. And there was a little period of time where I was in a semi-coma, if you will, then I recovered from that, and I thought, well, this is going to be a pretty rough year. The very first day, though, when a friend, eventually a friend that I would uh, befriend, uh, came and uh, knocked on the door and uh, made sure I had recovered. And we grabbed a bite of meat and we took the first trip up a mile high to the top of a mountain where radar and communications equipment was where we were supposed to maintain. And along the way, we turned a corner and ran into my first wildlife, which was a big, burly, a caribou buck. 
and through his marvelous uh, experience of driving this uh, tremendous truck, he was able to avoid being run off the road and down the embankment and into a, 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 off the mountain. And so that was my first day. Well, that was only the beginning because later on there was uh, six months into it, the worst storm of the century. Three days were there, almost blew the radio uh, station at the top of the mountain, off the mountain. I was there by myself because my partner got ill and uh, pretty much decided that freezing to death wasn't too bad. But then it turns out that I was able to recover and I found what the problems were of the shaking in the building. The signal had actually disappeared and later on it was discovered that the Russians had a spy ship in the Ar in, near the Arctic there and they knew my sight had gone down and we can speculate that maybe they were contemplating whether or not during this Cold War of 1959-1960 to even invade and start with my sight landing on the Alaskan coast. Uh, we did survive that, we did come down. Uh, many other things, we confronted the uh, walrus. Uh, in fact, we have a walrus tusk, a walrus uh, fight we did not get involved with, but after it was over, we were able to get the tusk as a souvenir, which we have. And then near the end, uh, we got into a situation where then in order to help a friend that had been injured on the mountain the day I was about to leave and come home a year in the Arctic here, uh, I uh, had to go up and take him up and bring him down. We confronted not one or two, but three caribou, and there was another 20 behind them. And through a lot of luck and using the strange truck that didn't have a muffler, it made a lot of noise, it, and a big book that swung back and forth, I was able to make the caribou more frightened of me in the truck than I was of them. And we made it down and was able to deliver my friend to the medical, get on the plane, and we were able to uh, come on back after that year. So we did come back, we did make the money, we did go to school, we did get married, and uh, that's of course a whole new story. We had earned enough money to go to school. We did get successfully through Purdue University with a great deal of pride. We not only earned one, we earned two degrees, but we then, through a friend's association, we then received an opportunity to work for, at that time, the, uh, the largest electronics company in the world, Radio Corporation of America, RCA. That was a tremendous 13 years. I had an opportunity to work with a team that invented a number of things. I think it was 13 or 14 patents. One of them was a part of the thing that dealt with automatic fine tuning electronically. It dealt with the first all electronic remote control system where you could get any channel in any order. And it went on and on and on in different things. Uh, it was quite an experience. I had to chance to meet with the top of people there in RCA and it was a time that I can only imagine that very few people have an opportunity to leave. It was an excellent, excellent period of time in a young engineer's life and uh, then I went on to later on start my own businesses. But I'll never forget those 13 years at RCA and the phenomenal people that I met and the opportunities and of course the patents that I was able to put together with all of their help. Many careers occurred after the RCA started my own businesses, built our house in Alpharetta. After we had finished that, my wife asked me, uh, all right, great adventure, well, what are you gonna do now? And an airplane, a small airplane was flying over and I said that, as I've always wanted to become a pilot. So that started a series of years of uh, not just learning to fly and soloing, which was another great day, but building an airplane in our garage with the help of uh, next door grandchildren and my wife and some friends. And we finally introduced the plane in 2004 and it had a big, uh, big fly in with uh, other pilots. Then I proceeded to really learn how to fly the plane and to land it, but there were a few, few oopses, we call them off-field landings, but most people refer to them crashes. So I had uh, three or four of those. Uh, it was difficult to explain to my wife, but she, she stuck with me. And the last one, I think, was the, uh, the one that, kind of joking, left my 10-year flying career on a high note. We were sitting high on a tree 
because we had to land, and uh, we'll use the phrase, crash into the top of the tree. All of those were so successful in the fact that even though they were accidents, uh, I was able to walk away without a scratch. That, along with all the adventures, I'm now putting in a series of books. So my latest career, now beyond all the ones before, is actually uh, becoming an author. And I have uh, one book published so far, which relates to uh, that uh, series of flights and landing in the tree. Uh, in my later life, while I'm writing books there, due to a family situation, I had the opportunity to write uh, uh, discover a number of things about global positioning. I, I invented a number of items that I received three patents. Unfortunately, it took about 10 years before I reached the, the companies that was able to do something with them financially for me. That's happened a couple of years ago, uh, so we've been very successful. So basically, uh, if you listen to a GPS and it talks to you, that's one of the issues of the patent. So I'm moving on. Uh, to uh, either more exciting things in the various books, but the GPS probably is the most important one of the late number of years that I experienced and I enjoyed most.